Well, good morning, church. Welcome. We're glad that you are here. Thank you for continuing to share in God's work here at Grace. We appreciate your prayers and continuing to share as we are taking care of our missionary partnerships and the work here at Grace. We have, it's been a while since we've talked about our five distinctives and who we are and what we long to be known for. And this is what it is. We want to be known for a Christ-centered preaching, passionate worship, fervent prayer, courageous evangelism, and purposeful disciple-making. And often these elements are now highlighted in this time that we are facing, that we're not allowed to come together. Before we come together, we'd love to hear from you. And there's a survey on our webpage. If you can go there, it's at the top of the homepage. Nine questions, because we want to hear as elders and leaders in the congregation, uh, how we b take the best steps in reopening and coming together to worship corporately again. And we long for that day. We've been in a series, Live Boldly. Been talking about this for some time now. Uh, Pastor Jamie's going to be preaching today on this series. If you'd like one of these uh, shirts, long sleeve shirts, short sleeve shirts, they're available. As long as they're available, just email the office and we'll be able to help you. If you'd like to have one of these, we'd love to have you wearing one of these wherever you go. So as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, let me just read from the words of the Lord Jesus, our Lord, our Master. And he says this in Matthew 5, verse 11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house." In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's let our light shine, especially in this time that we are living right now. We have been placed here for a reason as God's people for such a time as this. So continue to let your light shine. Let's worship together. We've waited for this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you, your glory like a fire. Awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise.
gates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, and filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, and filling every part of our praise. It's Lincoln. This month we're praying for Isaac and Gloria Shaw in India. We pray that their meetings and their Zoom meetings will go well, and we pray that um, the people that listen will be uh, encouraged to their word. And the, our verse this month is Malachi 3:10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, for there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. For I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you that we can uh, give you in this live stream today. And we pray for my dad that he's gonna preach and help give him wisdom to preach. And I pray that the people in uh, the Daily Bible Institute in India, that they're God, they will afford the Gospels and that everything will go well in India. In Jesus' name, amen. Tell mountains they must fall and they fall. You tell oceans to be still and their calm. You tell sickness in my sleep. In my weakness, God, I know you are strong. You are the one above it all. I stand in awe. You are the God over all I know. No higher name, no greater throne. You stand.
How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into
Well, good morning, church family. Uh, glad to be with you this morning. Um, definitely strange times preaching in the, in the church building. Uh, I definitely miss all of you uh, being together. Um, it's just different. It's different. Uh, lately, we've been going through a series. We've been talking about uh, live, living boldly. Uh, to be honest, it, it does seem a little more difficult right now to live boldly, uh, being so far separated from each other and from just regular routine. Um, over the past few months, I find myself uh, getting uh, just anxious, anxious over answers, details, situations, and things that are going on. Uh, when I get away from the Word of God, uh, my anxiety grows. When I'm in the Word, my boldness grows. I believe right now, for me and for us and you as well possibly, one of the greatest enemies to living boldly is anxiety. Anxiety is that worry, it's nervousness, it's unease, it's usually about an event that's going to take place, but we don't know the outcome. I can contemplate and think on things like I never have before. Some of it is because I have extra time on my hands. A lot of times I've been so busy, I really don't worry about things because my schedule has kept me super active. But now I start to pay attention to things that I didn't pay attention to before, and I start to frustrate myself, I frustrate my family, partly because I'm not trusting God. And I've found in my own life, it's a very difficult thing to do uh, to try and solve all of life's problems on my own. Now, I, I always want to know what's going to happen. I want to know when it's going to happen. I want to know why. I want the answers. And I think that's true for a lot of us. But a lot of times, I, I feel like when I do have those answers, I have more confidence. When I'm in control, I have a certain type of boldness. But I don't believe it's the boldness of living in Christ. There's so many things right now that I don't have the answer to, but I'm learning to trust God more and more each day. Now, for many of you, uh, maybe you're not experiencing a lot of anxiety. Maybe you're actually relaxing a little bit more and you're able to enjoy uh, what's going on around you. That may not be the case for everyone, though. So as we go through our passage this morning, I want you to remember that there are other people out there who are struggling and having difficulty. If you go through this and you say, you know what, right now this is not an anxious time in my life, I think then that this passage this morning may be for another brother or sister who is overwhelmed in anxiousness. So as you're taking notes this morning, as you're following along, as you're listening to what, what is being spoken, uh, I think that if you will take comfort in it, it will give you a boldness, but also it will prepare you to help someone else who may be struggling right now. So always be ready to help someone else just as much. Now, one of the characters we've looked at is uh, the life of Peter. We've, we've gone through various aspects of Peter's life. Peter is the one who had stepped out the most, trusted the most, and, and I think ultimately failed the most and was restored the most. We see Peter uh, deny Christ. We watch how he is restored when we went through the series of breakfast uh, with Jesus. Peter now is speaking to Christians who are suffering in Asia Minor. That's what we find in our first verse uh, of, this, of this chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3. If you do have your Bibles as you're at home, as you're getting comfortable, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 9. Let's go ahead and read that passage together. Follow along with me as we go through it, starting in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found, in result, found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray this morning. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning. Help us take comfort from your promises. Help our joy to be full. Help our anxiety to be cast onto you. That when we see your promises, it would overshadow the anxiety and uncertainties of what we're going through. And we will understand more of why. And we will glorify you. We will make you known more and more. Help us today to do that very thing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you think about it, people can't go very long without hope. And I think hope is more than just a knowledge. It's more than just a future hope. It's, it's having a living person to trust in that helps us in all of our life's situations. Bible commentators often call Peter the apostle of hope. In this passage, Peter links our new birth, our salvation, with the idea of a living hope. The hope Peter speaks of isn't like the wishful thinking usually associated with the hope that we have today, like I hope it doesn't rain or I hope it doesn't snow. Uh, I hope I pass a test. This is not the kind of hope that Peter had in mind. The Greek term for hope in this passage means an eager, confident expectation. This hope of the believer is not only living, but lively. Unlike the empty, dead hope of this world, this living hope is energizing. It's alive and active in the soul of the believer. Our living hope originates from a living, resurrected Savior. Peter's living hope is Jesus Christ. And I believe for us to overcome anxiety and fear that we're facing right now, we must have a living hope. Our living hope must be Christ must be in Christ. Our point and our truth for today is that we will live boldly when we remember these two truths about our living hope. Two truths this morning. And the first one we're going to look at is that our living hope provides a future inheritance. We see that in verses three through five. Now inheritance, it's wealth that's passed down. It's a legacy one receives as a member of a family. Galatians 4, 4, 5, and 6 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We are part of the family of God. The first thing we look at under our future inheritance is that our inheritance is provided by God. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Our inheritance is provided by God. The key to an inheritance is the one who is going to provide it. Back when I was in college, 1997, I got my first email address. It's the same email address I use right now. I wasn't very creative with the name. I had a college ID email through the school I went to. And then I just added at yahoo.com and used the same letters and ID numbers. But I remember getting my own email account. I signed up for whatever I wanted. I would enter for various things. And eventually, you know how your email gets out to one of those princes, the prince that's trying to navigate all his funds into American money. I remember getting that email and reading it thinking, this person doesn't have very good sentence structure. But I thought, wait a minute, they want to send me millions of dollars to help them set up their future and I'll get a huge percentage of it just for helping out. But I needed to give them my bank account information and routing number so that they could begin the process as soon as possible. Uh, I'm kind of glad I saw through that. I know uh, it's different these days. There's different ways at which people try and trick you into gaining this massive amount of money. Uh, I saw through it. I made it. I didn't give them any of my information. But a lot of times when we look at our inheritance, Who's the one that's providing it? It's God. The cause and the desire are His. We see the term His great mercy. Titus 3, 4 through 6 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Mercy, Tim Challies uh, writes it and explains it this way. He says, mercy is not something God owes to us. By definition, mercy cannot be owed. 
but it is something God extends in kindness and grace to those who do not deserve it. The second thing about our inheritance is that it is an indestructible inheritance from verse 4. It's an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Sometimes we look at words and we read them in English and we look at them and maybe we miss out a little bit on the color of what these things imply. Imperishable, meaning it's not corruptible. It's not liable to death. It's not subject to destruction. Think about everything that we have. Maybe the things that I want to pass down to my kids. I know when I bought my truck not too long ago, Lincoln's favorite question to ask was, is this going to be my truck? And I thought, probably. It's a few more years still, but the truck is corruptible. It's not a great inheritance, but it will be nice. But it's liable to die. It's going to break down. It's subject to destruction. When we think of an inheritance that God is providing us in the future, it's the opposite of all the things that we have in our life right now that we think about. The other thing about it is that it's undefiled. It means it's unstained and unpolluted. Everything in creation is stained and polluted by sin, but not the believer's inheritance in Christ. The last word I think brings the most vivid thing for us. It's an unfading. It's a word used in Greek to describe a flower that doesn't wither or die. Now, Mother's Day was just a week ago. Moms, how are your flowers doing? Maybe you still have them. Maybe you don't. At our house, we don't plant too many flowers. We don't do well with flowers. We have family that runs a floral shop. We have some friends that we've made that have a floral shop. Could you imagine if flowers never withered or never died? That would be super easy. We could all have whatever flowers we wanted. I think they would lose their magnificence if we didn't experience and have a joy for a time. But this word unfading means it doesn't lose its magnificence. Time, decay, the elements of the world won't affect it. You know when you get something new, you're super excited about it, you love it, you enjoy it, but over time, the magnificence of it fades away. But this is what we're saying here. The inheritance that God is providing for us in the future is unfading. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Everything we have in our lives, some of the things that are causing us our anxieties are the things that are just perishable and they're going to be gone and they're going to fade away. But what's to come in the future is the inheritance that never will. The last point we find in verse 5 is that our inheritance is, is reserved indefinitely who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's being guarded. It's being watched over. It's already in existence. It will not change and no one can plunder it. You can only imagine what the stock market price is and maybe what your future retirement plans are going through right now. I talked with a gentleman who was on unemployment right now and I asked him uh, how things were going. And he said, well, you know, I'm starting to not want to go back to work now. He's a little bit older, but he's still got a little time left to work. And I said, well, how much longer do you have to work before your retirement? And he says, well, the way things are going now, probably uh, when I die, I'll have to go back all the time. He's lost a lot of money. A lot of things have changed. His inheritance that he's been saving up for and storing for retirement for his life is now messed up because of the situation that our country is in. There's an uncertainty about what he'll do. But the reality is what's coming for us in the future is an inheritance that God has set aside and stored up for us. Now, all of these aspects of the first parts of these verses give us comfort and strength, knowing that in the future, we have an inheritance that God has provided for us. But it's not just meant to be head knowledge. Our living hope isn't just something that says one day, I guess I'll have happiness and I'll suffer, it's a matter of understanding what God has provided for us. It leads us to our second point, but it helps us understand that the doctrine, which is what God is explaining to us, is what helps us experience and have joy. See, faith turns sound doctrine into sound practice. It's not just thought to spare us until the end. I saw a commercial once. I think it was for coffee. I don't really know what it was for, but there's a mom. She's sitting on the couch and she's, she's in slow motion. 
She's drinking her coffee very slowly. In the background, you see one of the kids exploding a bag of Cheetos. You see another kid go flying by in the background. The dad's tossing all kinds of stuff, playing baseball in the house. It's just a chaotic scene. That's not what our future inheritance is intended to do for us, to make us just sit still, suffer, or just sit while the world around us is difficult, and then hope for a longing one day of heaven. We have a joy that's not just for the future that's after our life. It's for a daily joy that we can have every day. The second point about our living hope is this. Our living hope provides present joy as we walk through life. We see that verses 6 through 9. The first part of that is that it is a joy. It is a joy to walk through trials and tests. Verse 6, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In this future, in this, in this refers to future inheritance, uh, we greatly rejoice. Verse 6. In this, you rejoice. In this is referring to what we have as a future inheritance. We will greatly rejoice. We will be exceedingly glad. Now, one of the shows I like to watch is on car restorations, and uh, they build old junky cars, make them super fast, make them hot rods, or they deck them out and just make them collector's items again. Now, it's a great show. There's a lot of guys involved in it, but one of the days they went up north somewhere uh, to a Porsche factory. They took their crew with them. There's the guys that do all the work, and then there's the background guys. There's one of them who does the video editing. He edits all their videos and makes the, the videos really interesting to watch. You can imagine a car restoration may not be that great to watch one thing at a time, but the way he edits it, the whole crew, those that are more popular and famous in the, in the whole process, understand that it's because of him that they have great success and they're financially stable. So they took him there. They got one of these new Porsches out. It's one of the family car looking Porsches and they drive it around. They let their video editor drive it to get his thoughts to see what he thought about it. And then when they were done, they said, it's yours. And he was thought, okay, they're pranking me. It's just going to be a joke. They're trying to be mean because they do pranks a lot on their show. But then when he really settled in on the fact that these guys loved him so much that they said, you know, we're going to give you this vehicle. We love you. We love what you're doing. We love everything about how you're helping us be successful. If you could see the guy's face, he was exceedingly glad. He was overwhelmed. And that's something that's an inheritance, but it's, it's temporary. Matthew 5, 12 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice. It's that same word. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we understand the difficulties, when we look at the various trials and tests that we're going through, there's characteristics about them that will allow us to endure them better. The first one is when the, when the, when the scripture says they are for a little while. A little while. That's a transitionary thing. It's, it's just for a little bit. Now, recently I had a tooth pulled. I know from another sermon I shared how much I don't like the dentist and how much I haven't gone. And that's what brought me into the current situation I'm in now. Uh, I had to have a tooth pulled. Um, as I was having the tooth pulled, I had the shots, I had the gas, and I'm laying on the table or the chair, the, the surgeon's over my head, and he's holding one side of my mouth and my face. There's all kinds of metal equipment in my face. The nurse is on the other side of me. She's pulling my head the other way. And it doesn't really hurt as much as it is just super uncomfortable. But as they're pulling it, as things are happening, uh, my tooth breaks, and that means there's more drilling and... Uh, uh, I can feel it right now, honestly. It's crazy, but as I was going through it, I stared into the light for a moment and said, this is just temporary. It's going to go away eventually. It's just temporary. Now, I know that's not much of a trial or a tragedy or a test that I'm going through, uh, but man, was it painful. The whole process afterward, waiting for it to heal, still waiting for it to heal, it's just a time-consuming event. But it's a little while. I'm eventually going to look back on it and say, that wasn't that bad. I truly believe that a lot of the things that we're going through, they're just for a little while. The second thing we know about our, our trials and tests is that, that, they're, that they're necessary. 
The Bible, when it says, if necessary, I think means they serve a purpose in all of our lives. If necessary. There's not a trial or a test that you're going through that means absolutely nothing. The test and the trial that you're facing that may be making you anxious is there to reveal your lack of trust in what God may be trying to teach you. It serves a purpose in our life. It allows us to see possibly the area at which we are not trusting fully in Christ. It usually comes from wanting our way and our things. But it's necessary. The next thing is that it talks about being grieved. Sometimes it's not just a physical pain that you go through, but it's a mental anguish. It's a frustration. And we're told also that they're just they're varying and there are various types. There will be a grace to match each one of the various things that we go through. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We will be able to endure the various testing and trials and sufferings that we go through. Another aspect is that God tests our faith to reveal its genuineness. Now, he doesn't do it to see who is a Christian, but he does it so believers will gain joy and confidence in their proven faith. I mean, you think about what kind of fan you are for what type of team. You follow through the difficult times and you rejoice at the greatest and goodest or the best of times. So many times we get caught up when only wanting to rejoice in the good times and then becoming frustrated in the bad times. But God's testing allows us to gain confidence of knowing that we are His. The end result is resulting in this. It's resulting in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Christ. Now, we can receive praise from the Lord when we have been proven through our trials and having had been found faithful. Here's a parable that gives us a little bit of an example. Jesus taught his disciples the parable of the talents from Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 21 through 23 says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you up over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also Uh, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The example and understanding is that in in the end, the resulting praise and honor and glory is that God would tell us that we have been a good and faithful servant. It's also a joy to walk by faith in relationship with Christ. Peter encourages these believers, these fellow church people. He says to them, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Peter makes a pretty bold statement for them and to them. They don't see him. They may not have ever seen him. Peter was with Jesus for years, and he struggled, and he failed. He denied Christ. But he commends these believers when he says, you have not seen him, but you love him. The word love here is one of the strongest types. It's the love of the will. It's the noblest form of love. John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, He it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. They loved without seeing. This is what Peter says about them. They believe in him, and they are doing what he commands. The result is inexpressible. It's it's the word, it's kind of the explaining of, of, of higher than speech. And they will be filled with glory. That's to render highest praise. If you ask yourself this question, when was the last time you began to be overcome by anxiety and stress 
and you prayed. And the way at which God came through caused you not to be able to understand even how to express it in words because God was so overwhelmingly good to you. When was the last time you faced persecution? When was the last time you exercised your faith in a way that caused you to do and want to do nothing else than tell everyone else about how God had come through for you in a way that just made you want to sing out all the more? The final thing we look at is that it is a joy to walk in constant deliverance from verse 9. It says, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Obtaining there, it's a present tense. It's presently receiving for yourselves. It's not just when you die, you're delivered. It's that you have the opportunity and the power now to no longer live in sin or to live with anxiety. You have the opportunity to live boldly. The outcome of our faith is is referring to the believer's constant present deliverance from the penalty and power of sin, from its guilt, its condemnation, its wrath, it, the ignorance that comes with it, the distress, the confusion, the hopelessness, and the dominion of it. Daily, we have opportunity to trust Christ and to be free from the power and destructive nature of sin. The encouragement I leave you with is this from John 15, 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We have all the scriptural promises we need to overcome anxiety. We have everything we need to live boldly. When you find yourself trying to find all the answers and not able to find peace without it, or if you continually find yourself finding peace only because you can make all the decisions, you need to turn to Scripture. You need to be reminded of our living hope, not just for what God has prepared for us one day, but the joy that He's called us to and allows us to live in right now. Go and live boldly. After I pray in just a moment, there will be some follow-up questions for you to discuss uh, with your family And they will be a help to you in applying and seeking out the areas in which you need to apply these promises, maybe to the anxious areas of your life and to allow you to have a greater boldness in Christ. Let's close our time together this morning in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the living hope that you are to me. I'm thankful for the living hope that you are to this local body of believers. God, I'm thankful for the church worldwide. You are a living hope to us. We take comfort from your promises of what is to come after this life, but also the joy that we have in this life right now. God, I pray that those who are listening and watching right now would understand that all of these promises come through Christ. Your death, your burial, your resurrection, your power over the grave, As we call on your name for salvation, you bless and you give us a living hope for now and for eternity. God, I pray for the day that we're back together again. We worship out loud together again. God, we praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.